Well, we've been looking at various things, and then I was asked to look at the poem Midterm Break. Now, last week I started on reading skills, and I said that one of the first things you should do is look at the heading or the headline. Well, we don't have a heading or a headline, but we have the title of the poem. So your reading skills, whether you're applying them to a prose text or a poetry text, a piece of drama, use the same reading skills. So midterm, in the middle of the term, this tells us it is to do with school or it could be university. Midterm break. Usually universities don't have a midterm break. They might have a study leave, so it sounds like school. And a midterm break is a holiday. So the next thing you do in terms of your reading skills, once you've looked at vocab, actually let me put down vocab, make sure you've understood all the words. You then do some kind of prediction. So what do I think this poem is going to be about? It's going to be about fun, relaxing, enjoyment, enjoying oneself. Either the speaker could be a school child or an adult. A teacher loves a midterm break as much as children do. Relief, a chance to sleep. So those are the things I am predicting. Now, why is that important? Because I've often seen teachers ask a question, what is the irony implicit in the title? Remember, when you're answering an irony question, you say something like, the reader expects, the reader thinks the poem is going to be about. And then you say, but, and then you tell me what is reality. So having read this poem, the reader expects a poem focused on fun, and relaxation, but the poem is about sorrow and death. Irony questions are not easy, practice them. So what is our next step with our reading skills? The first thing that you do is you read the text and you look for any vocab you don't know. College should be okay. Sick bay. Most schools have a sick room. That's probably going to be a problem. To take something in one's stride is an idiom. We were talking about idioms earlier. It is colloquial, as we said. Is could going to be a problem? Staunched is probably going to be a problem. Snowdrops. Gordy, maybe even a poppy bruise. So you go through the poem and you read and read and read as many times as you need to. I don't know, five, six, ten. As many times as is necessary so you can say, yes, I have some understanding. I understand 
the gist, the basics, the outline. I basically know what is going on in this poem. And then you have to look up those words or find a friendly teacher to help you with those words. And you've got to learn them. So I was talking to one of my matrics on Sunday and said, um, she didn't know the word Ross. And I said, what are we doing about our vocab? And she said, I'll read more books. Ah, it's too late. Sorry, guys, when you are three, four, five, six, seven years old, you can read books and then you hear the words and you see the words and you get an idea of what they mean by hearing and seeing them over and over again. No, it is too late by the time you are in high school. You now have to write down words, write down the meanings, and with words that have more than one meaning, you write down all the different meanings, and then you have to learn it. So vocab is terribly important. I made the point last Tuesday that in a, a little extract of 13 words, the student didn't know two, couldn't answer the question. You've got to learn vocab. And it's not easy when you're picking it up as a second or third or fourth or fifth or sixth language. So it's got to be conscious. You must consciously say to yourself, what am I doing about my vocabulary? What words have I picked up in science? I was listening to Tabila and she used the word genre what do we understand by genre? How did she use genre? Is that how I would use genre? What's different? So you need to be picking up words in science, in biology, in history, in every single subject. And you need to know in my mother tongue, it's this, what is that word in English? What's the English word? What's my mother tongue word? I'm hitting huge problems with the word strumpet, whore, prostitute. Um, what are they in mother tongue? And then I hit the word pimp for Hamlet. And one of my Zulu students said, I'll ask my Zulu teacher. And the Zulu teacher came back and said, there isn't a Zulu word, we would say it in this way. So we need to know what is it in mother tongue? We need to be operating between English and mother tongue. So the concept that comes to you in mother tongue, you then get that concept coming once you've got the English word. And even if you're English home language and you speak English at home as a home language, you've still got to be improving your vocabulary all the time. Okay, so let's look at these words, having given you my favorite lecture on vocab. Right, Nell. Nell is a bell. So imagine there's a clapper and the bell can ring. So Nelling is that doing, doing, doing. It's that sound. Where do we use that in English? We use it for a funeral bell. So if we're talking funerals, we would use the word knell. So already we've got a sense of, hang on, something's not quite right. I sat all morning in the college sick bay. So if he's sick, why would he be sitting in the college sick bay? Counting bells. He's listening to the bells, the school bells. Ending the classes. Next bell, next class, next class ends. So there's something not right. And this word knelling, yup, as a reader, we're going, uh-uh, something's not right. So he goes home in the porch. I didn't, I didn't look at porch. So... Um, Imagine this is the front of the house. That's the front door. You know how you have a little, like an overhang? So like if it's raining and you can get right up to the door and be protected, that's the porch. So he steps in there and he meets his father. He'd always taken funerals in his stride. So if you're reading, paying attention, you would say, he had always. So you're going to ask yourself, and now? Now he's not taking it in his stride. So what does the colloquial idiom, take something in your stride mean? Okay, so now we need to do stride. So stride are those big steps, you know, easy big steps. So if you take something in your stride, you can just step. So imagine that there is, um, I don't know, a, a big stone. 
and you can just step right over it because your stride is big enough and you are tall enough just to step over whatever's in your way. Or, I don't know, dog poo or something. You just step right over it. So if you take something in your stride, it means that you cope confidently and easily with an obstacle. So clearly, this funeral is an obstacle. And you're saying to yourself, why? So you're starting to engage even on the first or second reading. So you, you've read it. You're now checking for vocab, but you're also starting to ask questions and you're starting to engage. So this is my biggest reading skill that I want to urge you to do is you don't just sit back and let the words pass in front of you. That is not engaging. If I say to you, read for pleasure, then by all means, you take the book, you sit back, you open it, and you just read. That's one kind of reading. This is a very different kind of reading. This is called studying for an exam. Very different. So you're going to engage. Big Jim Evans saying, it was a hard blow. Now in English, it has got to refer to something. So you write a little note. What? It was a hard blow. This is another idiom. Where's my nice blue? So this is another idiom. It is not literal. Now why am I suddenly getting agitated? Because I've seen teachers saying, now this is literal in this poem. No ways. This is an idiom. What does it mean if it's a hard blow? It is something very painful and difficult to cope with. Then we come to the baby, cooing. So babies coo, they kind of blow little bubbles. That's a baby cooing, right? And then we've got him embarrassed. So you say to yourself, why? Why is he embarrassed? Why? He's embarrassed by the old men standing up to shake his hand. So then you say, well, why are they standing up? Because if this is embarrassing him, why are they doing it? And they tell me they were sorry for my trouble. So you say, what trouble? So we've got more than one person clearly saying, sorry. Big Jim Evans saying it's a hard blow, saying he's sorry. These old men who are there. And then you also say, why are they there? He's, he's come in, come into whatever room inside after he's been in the porch with his father, and the room is filled with old men. Why? Then whispers informed strangers. Well, what are strangers doing in his home? And who are these other people who are whispering? And why are they there? That I was the eldest. So that tells you there's got to be more than two children. So we've got the baby, right? And we've got the eye of the poem. That's only two. But English can't use eldest unless there are at least three. So where's the, where's the child? Where's the other one? Away at school. Oh, okay. So that connects. If we just go here, that connects all the way up here to that stanza when he was in this college sickbay. As my mother held my hand in hers and coughed out angry, tearless sighs. So we had his father crying. His father's crying. And we've got his mother who isn't crying. She, but she's coughing out. Now, either too angry and too upset to cry, or she's cried and cried and cried and she's got no more tears, right? So you're saying, what is going on? Then at 10 o'clock, we've got the ambulance with the corpse, right? Dead body, staunch, the blood has been stopped, bandaged by the nurses, right? This is a, a, new, a new stanza. Next morning, I went up into the room. Notice the room, not a room, the room. Snowdrops. Okay, so I'm sure I've drawn snowdrops before. I have the feeling I have. Right, so a snowdrop is a little 
plant with white with white petals and sometimes it's got little dots of green down there so this should be green and then it's white um, and then this is the ground those are snowdrops so they're white and they're very pretty and they hang their heads and candles soothe the bedside ah oh, there's another word I soothed to soothe is to bring comfort to somebody who is distressed. It can even be a medicine. If I say to you, oh, you've got a cut. I've got a cut on this finger and all the sanitizers really getting to me. So you could say, oh, but Janet, I've got something to soothe that. And you give me an ointment and I rub it in and say, oh, it's very soothing. Thank you. It means it makes it feel better. So if you speak in a soothing tone to a child, you go, there, 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 there. Everything's going to be all right. There, there. I'm patting. There, there. You are using a soothing tone of voice. So the ointment soothes the cut on my finger, the pat, 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 and the, it's going to be all right. It's okay. Don't worry. Every, that's a soothing tone of voice. So the snowdrops and the candles are there to soothe, to comfort, to help at the bedside. So who's in the bed? I saw him. Again, we've got a pronoun that doesn't refer to anything. For the first time in six weeks, ah, there's the connection. Paler now, pale, white, wearing a poppy bruise on his left temple. Okay, so you know, well, you know that this is nice and thick. We talk about, you know, you're a, you've got a thick skull, but it's thin here. So if he's got a bruise here on his left temple, then that's quite thin and, and the brain is, is right there, right? Okay. The poppy bruise, you might think of a poppy as red. And here, because it's a bruise, I'm thinking more purple, you know, reddish purple. Purplish red on his left temple. Notice there's something very uncomfortable about wearing, wearing as if it was something he could take off almost. He lay in the four-foot box as in his cot, as if he were in his cot. No gaudy scars. The bumper knocked him clear. And so now we know what's happened. And now we know where the third child is. So this is the little brother who was hit by a car and, and has died. And he ends off with a four-foot box. A foot for every year. And that last line is like a punch in the stomach. So it is hugely sad. Notice that most of the poem is given to us very calmly. The, the narration is calm. What he's describing, the devastated father, the mother who can't even cry and, and just reacts with anger. And we can imagine who she angry with, everybody. Um, I would start with God and move right down. You know, she's angry with everybody, maybe even with herself. Angry with the person who was driving the car. Angry with the world. Angry with everything. And, and, and <laughs> she's, she's not hysterical, but, but that sense of the emotion is so powerful. It is like ripping her apart. And the brother who, who, who copes by, by observing, but the pain is there in the embarrassment. The men standing up, why? Because he is a close member of the family of the person who's died. And they're showing him respect. And he's finding that extremely uncomfortable. Um, he's not used to it. His father, who takes funerals in his stride, cannot deal with the funeral of his four-year-old son. 
So that's our, our kind of our second step. So if we just go back. So we've read and read and read. And the reading involves vocab and engagement. We've asked ourselves questions. We've tried to answer them. We've tried to make sense of the poem as we go. And now usually you turn to typical questions. Now students ask me what method they should use. I don't think there's any particular method. Use whatever suits you. But say to yourself, what are the kinds of questions that you get asked? And one of them is mood. So if we start with the beginning of the poem, how is the mood established? It's established above all in that word knelling, which gives us a sense of, of death. So if we look at mood, we'd say something like, the mood is ominous. There is a foreboding mood. There's a sense of disaster that has happened, and we as the reader are about to find out about it. An omen is a sign, and it can be a good omen or a bad omen, but the minute you use ominous, it's a bad omen. There's something terrible going to happen. So the mood is established in that first stanza. How? By the fact that he's sitting in the college sick bay, although he is not sick, is a warning that something's not right. The word knelling and the fact that the neighbors have come to fetch him. Then you also get asked about rhythm. Now, rhythm is not easy. So can we just discuss it? First of all, try not to talk about pace, which is fast and slow. I know teachers link these two, but before you get to pace, try to talk about rhythm. So rhythm is where the stress falls in a line. And you're trying to see if there's some kind of pattern which echoes something or imitates something. So if you say something like the beat of the horse's feet, the beat of the horse's feet, da 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 da, da you can hear that the rhythm is echoing, mimicking. That's another word that you can use. Mimics, imitates the sound of horse's feet. So do we teach you all the patterns that can be taught? No, we don't. I think the one that you are meant to know is iambic. But on the whole, we're not asking for that. We're saying to you, can you feel a rhythm in these lines? And if so, what does it imitate? What does it suggest? I suppose you could even use a vague, it suggests. But if it echoes, imitates, or mimics something. So let's just go back. I sat all morning in the college sick bay, counting bells, knelling classes to a close. At two o'clock, our neighbors drove me home. There isn't anything really significant in that rhythm. The pace is slow, but the rhythm, I sat all morning in the college sick bay, it's just giving us a sense of something very weighty. All right, let's go on. In the porch, I met my father crying. He had always taken funerals in his stride. Ah, now we can hear something of the rhythm there. He had always taken funerals in his stride. So here the rhythm emphasizes the past, what has happened in the past, and leads us therefore to an awareness of this funeral is going to be one the father cannot cope with. So there's one line where the rhythm works quite nicely because it's drawing our attention. The keywords always funeral stride. The keywords 
are making us aware that this funeral is different. This funeral is one that he cannot deal with. This funeral is an obstacle that he can't get over. All right, so that's rhythm. Then you also get asked about stanzas. You can count them one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. There are seven stanzas. Do you see how many lines? Always count the lines. One, two, three, 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 and then there's this. So I was saying to a student today, when you're asked about structure, look for a pattern. So we've got X number of stanzas with this pattern. So we've got the stanzas with the three lines, three lines, three lines. And then suddenly we have one line. And you have to say to yourself, why? Why is that one line separate and by itself? And obviously you're going to say the shock as we absorb the fact that he is four years old and the youth of the child, he is a child. He's basically only a toddler. And you know what always occurs to me is I was at a primary school where the mother was bringing the child to school. She was holding the little girl by the hand and the car hit them both. The mother's leg was broken. The child was killed. So it's always for me, the four-year-old, I think of that and wonder if the driver even saw him because he's so little. And did the driver not even see the child in the road and just straight into him? So that last line is, is just dreadful, and that's what it's meant to be. It's meant to be a kind of blow, this, this here. This is a, a blow to the reader.